Okay, thank you everyone. Welcome back. Um, I hope you've had a, an excellent lunch. Um, we've been talking about the relationship between the United Kingdom and the rest of the world, and I, I've always thought one of the great challenges of integration to British higher education is the triangle sandwich. Um, certainly on previous uh, research projects, it's been a, a barrier of intercultural uh, uh, engagement, and so I was glad to see that there was a slightly wider selection. I hope you've had a, a, a very nice uh, lunch. Um, my name is Tristan McCowan. I'm uh, the incoming deputy director of CG. Uh, and it's my huge pleasure to introduce the uh, next keynote. We've had a trajectory today from looking predominantly at the national to the regional, the European. And now we're going to go way beyond that to the global level. Um, um, what better person to lead us on that journey than Maheke van der Ven, uh, who is a truly global scholar not only in the subject matter of her research around globalization and internationalization and their impacts on higher education systems in many different aspects of those systems, but also in her own global engagements. So she's distinguished professor of higher education at Utrecht University in the Faculty of Law, Economics and Government. But she also has affiliations with a number of other institutions around the world, um, some of which are, are, are engaged with CG as well. Um, guest professor at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, uh, also has affiliations at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and the uh, Academy of Europe. I'm sure many of you in here are very familiar with Mahek's work. She's written very extensively on a range of topics that are of huge interest to CG and uh, higher education research uh, around rankings, internationalization, regionalization, Bologna, geopolitics of higher education, and so forth. Uh, and it's a very enticing prospect to have her engage with such an important issue today. On the learning curve, new realities for higher education in a changing global context. Please join with me in welcoming Mahaka. Thank you for a lovely introduction. Um, let's see. And good afternoon, everyone. I was delighted with the invitation to speak here today. And um, I was ensured in the invitation that you will be the only non-UK speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and this weekend, when I was on my way back from the Times Higher Education China Forum at Nankai University, I received another message from Simon saying, as you stand to speak, the UK will be in the EU though we don't know how for how long. I had the pleasure to contribute to, I think, one of the preliminary studies that CG did on Brexit already in 2017 and entitled my chapter, my contribution, Stages of Uncertainty, Brexit and the Unknown Future of UK Dutch Higher Education Corporation. Um, well chosen title, although I hadn't thought there would be so many stages of uncertainty. From the Dutch newspaper yesterday. Well, I guess that that is indeed where we stand uh, today. And so here I am to bring you greetings from the continent. <laughs> yes, I will speak from a European perspective. I am European. And so I'll aim to address the new realities for higher education in a changing global context. But I'm not claiming to present a global perspective, if, if that exists at all. I'm not going to present a complete global overview um, only, but will mostly focus on Europe, China, and the US, indeed, uh, the continents where I'm affiliated uh, to. It's not to say that I will not speak um, or avoid to speak about the situation in the UK. And I feel for you that Brexit is an awful situation for British higher education from which its global reputation is already suffering. But you're not alone in this. Both in the US and in Europe, we can see these same polarizing political trends which do indeed affect the internationalization of higher education. 
I will come back to the situation in Europe as the second part of my talk, when I will address the EU's internal concerns. In the third and last part of my talk, I will try to theorize these tensions in terms of the challenges of governing open higher education systems, that is, finding the balance between the virtues of an open system, the benefits of internationalization, with the disadvantages of a constrained national sovereignty, which is required for the steering capacity to balance access, cost, and quality in higher education. But let's first take a look at this major global development, the rise of China and how it affects global higher education and the opportunities and challenges this represents for, for Europe in particular. And let me, start from, let me start from some very recent events that may have escaped your attention due to Brexit. Um, the 23rd of um, March, Saturday, Dutch and other newspapers, and I'm sure I'm totally counting on your language multilingual <laughs> abilities, New Hope or New Deal, China is more important than Brexit. That was the spread in our um, main newspaper on that Saturday. Um, despite, it was reporting, despite all the time the leaders in the last EU summit had to spend on Brexit, China would, should be more important to the EU than Brexit. The day before, Italy has signed billion euro uh, deals with China. And it's the first G7 and EU country to join the New Silk Road. Luxembourg the same day, not really G7, but still. Sunday the 24th, the U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands rages on Dutch national television that Huawei should be blocked in contracting 5G networks because of um, inbuilt cybersecurity threats. The U.S. does not want us to engage with China. U.S. ambassadors in all countries are spreading that message. Tuesday 26, President Xi meets with the EU at the Global Governance, the Global Governance Forum in Paris and has talks with its host, President Macron, and with Chancellor Merkel and EU Commission President Juncker. It seems the EU wants to go its own way, not be dictated by the US, and now presents its renewed terms and conditions for cooperation with China. German Chancellor Merkel found out about the force of foreign Chinese investment when the FBI warned her that German robotics mate of KUKA was almost purchased by China. And since then, Germany has stepped up the rules for foreign takeovers. <coughs> French President Macron also understands that on ne peut pas être naïf. Again, your multilingual global <laughs> abilities. You can't be naïf in dealing with China. The relationship, he says, is not just about trade, it has a geopolitical and a highly strategic character and the EU has got to get its act together. Dealing with the rise of China is now a top priority for the EU, not only because China has become a major competitor, but also because the EU has become aware of the impact of China's New Silk Road, or One Belt, One Road, or Belt and Road Initiative. Chinese investments in Europe may create new dependencies, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, where China is talking with the 16 plus one group, and in the South of Europe, where in turn for badly needed foreign investment, China is gaining strategic ownership in, for instance, harbor cities. But the EU has also become aware of the huge opportunities that the new Silk Road represents, for instance, in Germany and the Netherlands that both figure they will be a final destination on the New Silk Road. Firstly, overwhelmed by the economic and scientific capabilities of China, the, EA, the EU has, has at first been strongly attracted and only more recently became more aware of the related risks. It has, the EU as well, stepped up screening of foreign investment of unwanted technology transfers and now wants to negotiate fairer conditions for access, standards, intellectual property, and so on. 
at this last EU summit I just mentioned, China was even labeled as a system rival. And I think not only in terms of digital or cyber systems, but also with respect to alternative systems of governance that could be rival to democratic principles. Yet, the EU believes in multilateral trade and cooperation. And Juncker said, the NSA should not be seen as a threat and the EU should participate more in building the new Silk Road. So, engage. And being at the Global Governance Forum in Paris, President Xi shared his concerns about rising anti-globalization and protectionism and confirmed the importance of multilateralism and to uphold and jointly reform frameworks such as the WTO. And the same message in defense of multilateralism and free trade was consequently trumpeted by China at the BOA Forum in Asia and in bilateral talks with New Zealand later that week. All of that in one week. Sending clearly a very positive message in response of the pessimism spread by U.S. attitudes which colored the atmosphere at the World Trade Forum in Davos earlier on. Yes, China is on a mission, not only trying to boost globalization on its terms, but also to further the re regional integration in Asia and across the Eurasian continent. So while at the New Silk Road Summit in 2017 only a few leaders were present, now the EU is organizing a special summit on the 9th of April to self-consciously prepare the next one with China that will be in September. Well, that is unless the 9th of April will distract them totally again by Brexit 10th of April. Why am I telling you this? As I said in my abstract, I quote, favorable times for internationalization of higher education were characterized by multilateral economic politics, regional integration, the knowledge economy paradigm, and liberal values of an open society, end of quote. But as the US is turning away from multilateralism and the UK from regional European integration, the question is whether we should now see our relations with China in the light of a partnership that is essential to sustain and reform the global institutions that support multilateralism. I guess we might, at least when it concerns economic globalization and free trade. More concretely, China, much criticized for uneven access to markets, announced these last week's events. You can see it in the text underneath um, the photo, which is from the China Daily, China newspaper. It promised at all these occasions to further open up for foreign investment and to relax internal conditions for foreign activity as to create a level playing field. This would, for instance, include IPR regulations and access to service sectors, including financial services, health, and education. This is, of course, potentially interesting for those who want to undertake overseas education activity in China. I think it would be good to have China on our side in defense of multilateral trade and um, open borders, and for the peace accord on climate change as well. But how should we understand China's view on what it labels as more equal and inclusive globalization? What is globalization with Chinese characteristics? And how will this align with issues around human rights, the rule of law, civil society, and other essential European values underpinning an open society? Hard to tell. I don't know. But what I do know is that China challenges some of our most important assumptions regarding the working of economics and societies and of science and society. I also know that it was thus, 
a very good idea to undertake a research project on uh, the new Silk Road and its implications for higher education and research cooperation between uh, China and Europe. And as you can see, a number of the um, centers and institutes present here today are partner in this project, of course, in, uh, including uh, Simon's uh, work. I've been, I've been interested in, in the rise of China and more precisely in how China perceives globalization and acts in the global sphere, which I've been able to observe for more than 10 years through my connections with Shanghai Jiatong's center um, and the graduate school. And from the research that I um, conducted there at Shanghai Jiatong in cooperation with Harvard University, we already concluded that, that it was time to see China not just as a follower, but also more perhaps as a potential leader. And with the events in the West in 2016, I think that that whole process accelerated with the potential um, impact of China's new Silk Road being, uh, becoming more clear. So in 2017, we decided to build a network and to continue um, this research um, with a project that was launched in Utrecht in 2018. We're interested in understanding as in this research better what's happening along the new Silk Road in terms of student mobility, researcher mobility, IDs traveling along. We're interested in, in looking at what institutions do, higher education institutions do collaboratively or on their own. We're interested in analyzing then under which conditions this is happening. And even more so, who defines these conditions and based on which values, including what idea of the university, what ideas on research and academic uh, integrity, et cetera, et cetera. We think it is relevant because, well, the New Silk Road is more than, um, uh, than about consumer goods, like in the historical version of it, China's rise is definitely one of the most important uh, geopolitical <coughs> shifts in, um, in this period, and it will have its impact. Um, not at least because of its size, and also we feel that we need to understand globalization better and from different perspectives. Um, what we do, for instance, but I'm gonna go very, very quick, is looking at student mobility. Well, we already found out, actually the OECD found out, it said for a while, oh, international global mobility is stagnating. No, it wasn't looking at the growth in developing countries. The growth continued, but less so in OECD countries, but more in developing countries or non-OECD countries. And you'll see China is very important in that. And on the lower part, you may be able to see, but that is IIE data where oh, all of a sudden China wasn't even in the top 10 and it's now number three. Those data include a lot of non-degree, non-tertiary students, like they are included in the US data. They're also here included in the Chinese data. But if we look at, take a closer look at what's going on in terms of how many students China is sending out, how many students China is attracting from abroad, and who is returning from to study abroad back to China, thanks to Lin Chan, I have this chart, it's not easy to compose, we can see that this is going to create an enormous shift, both in the West as well as in China. This data, again, include, we have to be very, very precise, there are a lot of non-degree students, but fewer, still almost half of these students are non-degree students. Lynn will, will present more on, on this in the next session, so I'm going to go very fast. She's also going to talk about this. Where do they come from? Well, mostly from Asia, a lot from Belt and Road countries, as they're called, Central Asia and a lot of them are important when it comes to, um, to the, the bachelor and the master students in particular. Right, um, I'm going to switch to research, some data on research, I think you know them. Uh, China now has bypassed the spending on R&D as percentage of GDP and, and uh, in, in terms of its actual budget, 
that of the EU since 2014. Um, it has the second largest pool of researchers and it has bypassed the US in scientific output in SNT articles. Um, in the top 10% of that, you can see that that has gone at the expense of the world share of the US, while the EU is more stable. And here you can see, first of all, that yes, the world class, the double world class project building on 9 uh, 985 and 211 is paying off. These, these, these uh, Chinese policies are paying off, but, or not but, and <laughs> for the moment, this is mostly observed in STEM research. China is very strong in STEM. Um, this is about the size. And here you have data on where China is leading, where it is not only number one in the world, but where it also has a substantial more than 20 out of the 50 top uh, places in the world. And you can also see, if you have very good eyes, but uh, that from only from 2017 to 18 already, you know, those numbers go up very, very quickly. Okay, this is the Shanghai ranking, so you may think, well, let's have a look at another ranking, but same picture. <laughs> same picture, Leiden ranking confirms this. Although, two things, um, at the very right-hand column with the highest impact measure, it's still a smaller impact, but as the as it is growing from the left to the right, it will certainly get there as well. Not outside STEM. Not outside STEM. There we don't see the Chinese universities showing up in the rankings. It's a discussion why that is. Right, so the question is, um, is this, this uh, Belt and Road or the whole relationship between um, China and, and the EU uh, changing? Um, what we do here. A analysis of, I have to see, yeah, 40 years of cooperation between the EU and China in research and higher education, which I carried out over the last uh, couple of months, um, shows that it has become closer, more intense, aiming for more equal-based cooperation and increasingly aimed at working towards common global goals. At the same time, China has <coughs> sorry, developed at great pace from a developing country to a partner, even to a competitor of the EU in specific knowledge areas. And this cooperation is thus becoming more strategic and more complex. Um, let's see where I am. I trace the cooperation from the predecessor of the EU, the early 70s, and the opening up of China in 78. We see some patterns of convergence. For instance, both are interested increasingly in knowledge, building the knowledge economy, first for national social economic development and then for global competition. The EU since 2000, remember the Lisbon objectives, China later since 2013. So growth announced. That doesn't exclude cooperation towards global common goals or common goods, for instance, the UN Social Development Goals, and cooperation as designed in the latest EU China roadmap is indeed geared towards global challenges in areas such as, such as sustainable energies, food technology, and environmental management. But these plans do so far, so far, not cover other areas of high potential in the next area, dec decade, such as in advanced computing, data science, robotics, artificial intelligence, areas in which China wants to become the world leader by 2030. I'm sure new plans are in the making. Um, there are also some convergence in mechanisms and instruments joint programming mechanisms, co-funding instruments, but convergence is less obvious when it concerns, for instance, the conditions for data privacy, data sharing, since all scientific data generated in China must now be submitted to government-sanctioned data centers before appearing in publications. 
This in contrast to the EU's promotion of open access, open science, and feeding into persistent concerns about mutual openness, but also research in integrity and academic freedom. The EU is more open. Horizon 2020 is open to the world, including China. Erasmus Plus is open to the world, including China. Convergence is also much less obvious in education. Not only is the EU-China cooperation in this area even, even less balanced than in research, <coughs> China seems to unilaterally tighten its conditions for such cooperation. It seems paradoxical that Jean Monnet actions bring European studies to China and at the same time constraints for um, open discussion on Western values is spread in Chinese classrooms. At the same time, New Silk Road initiatives such as the University Alliance of the New Silk Road, opened in 2015, crossing... <laughs> I think this, we haven't been given a warning of a, a fire drill. Thank you very much, everyone. We're going to make a start again. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, patience and good humor during that enforced fresh air break. Uh, I'm pleased to say we have more or less the same number of people now as we did before, which is also good news for the conference. Um, We've made the decision that uh, there is nothing in the rest of the program that we want to lose. Uh, so we're going to push the, the rest of the program back by half an hour. So everything that's, that is listed, every timing from now on will be half an hour later. I won't, I won't go through the individual uh, items, but uh, we will end this session at a quarter to three. Uh, and then it will be uh, the remaining uh, events half an hour later than that. Um, without further ado, I will hand back to Mahek for the rest of her talk. Um, good. Um, I, was, I was saying that uh, we see a lot of new alliances emerge, um, I think, uh, related to the New Silk Road, and I was describing a few, naming a few. Um, the University Alliance of the New Silk Road, uh, 128 universities joined um, the University Strategic Alliance of the Belt and Road, 126 universities, and it goes on with more and more alliances sprung out of China and collecting a lot of members. And they all soon seem to be underlying, underlining sorry, a growing preference for a more, a perhaps more Eastern orientation or perhaps a cooperation approach with Chinese characteristics. What we also see, and then I finish on this, is that there is persistent imbalance, back to the EU-China uh, collaboration, um, persistent imbalances in flows of students, researchers, grants, money, and as I already said, a strong uh, bias towards um, STEM. I have to see where I am in my slides. Yes, here you can see what has come out of um, Horizon 2020, co-publications, China, EU, it's 90% STEM. Um, the relationship, as I said, has evolved with great speed from aid to cooperation to competition in line with China's development from the workplace of the West and a country from which certain countries like to recruit a lot of full fee paying students to China 2025, created in China, etc. This implies for those who want to undertake for an investment in education in China, they need to realize, I think, that China isn't anymore the workshop of the world from which one can recruit all those students. Um, but um, they will have to, I think they will be expected to contribute to China's aim of moving from made in China to created in China. It is also, I think, still far too early to see whether under the newly announced further opening up, indeed the tightened oversight of foreign activity, co-governance, obligatory NGO registration, and even classroom censoring regarding spread of Western values will indeed be relaxed. We don't know that. 
for those who cooperate, I think it is important to see that the model of the university that China is promoting is um, more towards the utilitarian model of the university with a strong core in STEM rather than the Humboldtian university. Um, which raises questions, of course, on how the strong research teaching nexus can be developed and whether the concept of Lehr und Lernfreiheit is really um, achievable. Probably more attractive for institutions with an equally strong STEM focus. But still, then you, need to, you want to bridge the disciplines for achieving innovation and creativity. It also means, as a last point, that cooperation becomes more strategic. And I don't mean strategic in, let's say, UK terms of markets, budgets, marketing, branding, not that strategic. But strategic in the actual use of the knowledge acquired and developed, including dual use. That is, who's studying here? With whom do we cooperate in research? And what is the knowledge actually going to be used for? for civic or for military applications or for both. That's dual use. So I think, as we also in the Netherlands discussed it, yes, uh, like the EU spirit, keep collaborating. But you can't be naive. So clear guidelines to be developed in data management, the code of concept, research integrity and ethics, it should all become available, I think. Um, desirably under international standards and equal conditions. The challenges that that represents to achieve that to the EU are important, especially when you take into the consideration the competencies of the EU. You may not expect to hear anything about EU legislation <laughs> here today in this concept, but I think it is important you realize the EU is the only actor, I think, to be able to deal with China because the individual European countries are, are, are too, too small. Um, and for the, to in, in order to actually achieve a more balanced relationship and cooperation on equal terms in these important areas, I think it needs to use its competencies in trade more than those in education which are very weak, or even those in research, although they are a little stronger. Um, maybe I'm not going to be very long on this, but in, tra in trade, the, U uh, the EU has exclusive competencies. It can deal internal and externally in trade on behalf of all the EU countries on its own behalf. And in research, it is in a, a shared competence in, in education, it basically has a very weak no competence because the countries, the member states have the um, sovereignty. So perhaps future higher education and research collaboration will become more administered under trade agreements. Under WTO gets, perhaps, we've heard this before, and we were reminded, reminded by Anne Corbett recently that WTO arrangements for higher education may also return on the agenda as a result of Brexit. The EU is not only hindered in its, in its dealing with China because of its different levels and strength of its competencies, but also by a lot of internal concerns. These have to do with the anti-globalization sentiments and nationalist, protectionist, and polarizing tendencies. And as I've said, these have emerged not only in the UK. That's the second part I promised you to talk about. Such tendencies have actually never been completely absent on the old continent, but researched over the uneven outcomes of globalization the effects of the global financial and consequent euro crisis, and even more so with the refugee crisis. And they now seem to be turning against the EU with its freedom of the movement of persons as one of its cornerstones and therefore of concern for higher education. I've also been undertaking some work on this as partner in the project, which is led by um, the Center for Studies in Higher Education at UC Berkeley on neo-nationalism and the university. With the term neo-nationalism, <coughs> we aim to define the type of nationalism that emerged in the mid-2010s 
when Europe's political landscape and it re in Europe's political landscape and relates to anti-immigration, anti-globalization, right-wing populism, protectionism, and Euroscepticism. In Europe, we've seen rising nationalist parties since the 1980s, especially in France and the Netherlands, which also voted against, of course, the EU constitution referendum in 2005. And indeed, far-right parties have seen significant gains in Europe since. Um, the Freedom Party in Austria, Front National in France, Alternative for Deutschland, etc. The Lega, the Lega in Italy. This trend, however, was not all across the board. Nevertheless, and with the next European Parliament elections inside for May 2019, there are some fears that this may turn out to be stronger. Political scientists note that even though nationalist parties are on the rise, there is no universal trend towards nationalism. And they find that the increased visibility in global politics is less attributable to a shift in attitudes, but rather to the political and social articulation of these attitudes. I think you have also the media in mind here. Likewise, and contrary to what is often spread in the media, also in Europe there has been no negative trend in identifying with the EU. <coughs> Data from the autumn 2018 Eurobarometer reveal on average an upward trend in this area and a range of other topics relevant for, for higher education. As you can see, the overall data confirm that the trust in the EU has risen considerably since 2015. And the data on identity, immigration, freedom of movement, um, which are all particularly important for us and are striking. The highest proportion of people ever since this, was, um, this question was asked in 2010, identify with the EU as a citizen, 71%, or having a dual nationality, uh, identity. The concerns over immigration decreased strongly, although they're still the biggest concern. The free movement of EU citizens to live, work, and study and do business anywhere else receives the highest level of support as a policy priority, 83% and is much more seen as a positive result of the EU now than in 2015. But, well, but, I'm <clears throat> sorry, these trends seem to indicate that the EU is recovering from the downsides, um, and trust is also on the rise. But, the but was coming. These trends are based on averages, and for the AEO as a whole. And it is thus important to look at the countries at the extremes and both sides, positive, negative. And then we see smaller Nordic and Baltic countries to be, tend to be very much on the positive and, and the UK, Greece, and some other countries in the south and eastern part rather negative. But still, with Brexit in mind, it's quite surprising to see that only 31% of UK citizens see immigration as the main concern facing the EU which is well below the EU average of 40%. And that the free movement of EU citizens is still supported by 74% of them. In any case, these data seem to confirm that even though nationalist parties are on the rise in Europe, there is indeed no general negative shift of attitudes towards um, na nationalism um, or a negative um, trend in identifying with the EU or a decline in this identity. Again, political scientists argue that this may appear at first contradictory, but might be explained by the political and social articulation of nationalist attitudes that has changed and the polarization that shifted in support of nationalist candidates. How are universities affected? Well, for us, the positive attitudes towards the EU are of obvious importance. In particular, the fact that the free movement of the EU citizens is seen as the most positive research uh, result as the EU and receives the highest level of support as a policy priority. The Erasmus program was rated the fourth best outcome of the EU, after peace and the euro. However, as said before, they reflect averages and perspectives may be 
quite different in the countries at the extremes of the spectrum and in the periphery of the EU. And there, universities may be, in, may be at risk and more in the, I wanted to say in the fire zone, but I don't care to say it. <laughs> We were in a university in the virus. Um, so, um, as shown in, in this chart, you can see that, that the UK, UK is clearly on the negative side there. Hungary is another example. And although the scores on European identity are, are relatively high there, immigration is seen there as a very important threat to the EU. And regarding national health and social security, there's a lot of concerns. And so these citizens may be easily mobilized against immigration and beyond that. The political conspiracy that eventually forced the Central European University to leave the country has also affected other institutions in Hungary, such as the Constitutional Court, the freedom of press and certain NGOs. This caused the EU to trigger Article 7 disciplinary procedure against Hungary for undermining democratic rules and being a clear risk of serious breach of the values referred to in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. Also in more moderate countries, higher education can be caught in the political polarization and become a target of populist discourse. As part of the welfare state arrangements that these parties claim to be protected as for their citizens first or exclusively for them. The Netherlands and Denmark are, for instance, countries with an overall moderate score um, and, and high levels of trust in the EU. And nevertheless, in both countries, governments are currently looking for measures to control and even reduce the number of international study, uh, students studying at national public universities, and we see in both countries campaign against teaching in English um, as a foreign language. Another example concerns Switzerland, not in the EU, but in the free trade uh, agreement, which has as a result, I think you know, of the 2014 referendum, lost access to um, certain EU programs the same as may happen here. These four countries, Netherlands, Denmark, Switzerland, and the UK, have two particular features in common. Although they have different positions within in, in out the EU, they're highly internationalized higher education and research systems, and they belong to the strongest performing research systems globally in terms of quality and impact. They have the highest percentages of international PhD students among OECD countries, um, above 40%. In the Netherlands, even 40% of all our academic staff across all fields is international. And here, I think that number is true for top universities in um, European staff. Clearly, such Open systems greatly benefit from open borders and the participation in EU. We've heard it this morning, for instance, the ERC, return on investment, etc. but can be seriously affected if the free mobility principle is restricted. In some cases, the university sector itself may actually seek for policies to more effectively influence the in a particular uh, the out and particular inflow of international talents. And that is because it needs to, uh, it has a need for more effective steering of students' flows, which are understandable given the conditions in which universities and governments have to operate in Europe. The EU provides them with major opportunities for internationalization, open borders, Erasmus, Horizon, but at the same time constrain their options to regulate certain consequences at the level of the system or the institution. Open borders were favorable, of course, under Erasmus on student exchange, but with, Be with Bologna, this became free degree mobility with no mechanisms to manage reciprocity. And these flows have become quite uneven indeed. 
I go back to, a, to an example of my own country, we have seen in research universities the percentage of international students double in 10 years, and we have now 25% of our master's students are international, which is double the OECD average. The forecast of further growth indicates that EU students in Dutch universities may take up some 15% of the public budget for universities in a few years' time. And within a fixed macro budget, that means a serious reduction of the per capita funding, and thus Dutch research universities are worried about quality um, of teaching. Denmark is facing comparable challenges. Tuition is free there, and students have loans and scholarships, EU students have loans and scholarships available. Danish ministers are now questioning the value of that spending and also there, it has required institutions to reduce the number of programs taught in English. Denmark has also asked the EU to, uh, the Commission to help solve the problems of students who were unwilling to pay back these loans, but found no support in Brussels. I think the problem is known in this country as well. It is clear that as much as there is support for subsidized short-term uh, student exchange under Erasmus, um, that the, the free mobility of degree students in Europe is more difficult to sustain, or I could even say unsustainable, under the current conditions. Universities in countries with open systems may greatly benefit from the inflow of international students, but have also seen the support for nationalist and populist parties rise in their countries. Ministers are then caught between issues of national interest, economic growth, highly skilled migrants, and nationalistic pressures for upcoming, from upcoming political parties. And internationalization of higher education may then be seen as a problem rather than an opportunity. But as said before, and Simon said it this morning as well, these pressures do not only come from external parties or populist groups. Universities cannot assume that anti-internationalization or anti-globalization trends are exclusively manifest outside their walls. Skepticism of internationalization can also be heard inside, and they, for instance, may rally against teaching and learning in English, which is very much on the agenda in the Netherlands. This, I think, is illustrates how complex the consequences of internationally attractive open higher education systems can be and how vulnerable universities may become as a result for populism. And then it is easily, that, that then easily criticize their international aspirations as part of their anti-global and anti-elite discourse. In that fashion, a new populist party <coughs> Forum for Democracy, it's called, has won the provincial elections in the Netherlands two weeks ago, led by a leader with a doctorate from Leiden University who proclaimed in his victory speech that, I quote, universities are among the institutions that undermine society, end quote. The party has opened a website a week later where students can report unwanted influence of liberal left-wing teachers. As I said, universities can be caught in the political polarization that happily critique their internationalization um, and wish to protect universities at the kind of welfare state arrangements that they consider to be for their citizens first. Access, cost, and quality of higher education are concerned. We know this as the higher education trilemma. But in open higher education systems, governments and institutions face an additional trilemma, the globalization trilemma, in that they cannot have national sovereignty, globalization, open system, and democracy at the same time, as coined by Harvard economist Danny Roderick. Thus, open higher education systems benefit from internationalization but may lose control over access to higher education and the steering capacity 
sovereignty needed to balance cost, quality, access is being reduced. Roderick points out that globalization can only work for everyone if all countries abide to the same set of rules as laid down in some form of global governance. And as I said in my abstract, the need for global governance has been recognized in higher education and global, gov global higher education may be a popular concept, but neither a global system of higher education or global governance has actually emerged. At best, a quasi-market perhaps, but without clear rules. Roderick's condition hasn't been achieved in the EU either. At the contrary, because the EU, it's likely the world's most far developed publicly regulated space for higher ed, but the EU member states are also reluctant to give up sovereignty, hence the very weak competencies of the EU, and consequently the conditions as created under the EU treaty on the freedom of movement are not in balance with the EU's legal competencies to coordinate higher education and thus to regulate for the consequences. To conclude, and this gets us back to <laughs> the role of the EU, universities are thus confronted with different aspects of EU law through legally binding instruments, hard law, regulations, and different recommendations, opinions, what have you, soft law. This offers them opportunities, but it may also imply a loss of control over their policies, for instance, regarding admission, fees, and quality. The extent to which universities can have actually navigate this complex space depends on their degree of institutional autonomy, but also here are concerns. EUA, it was already referred to this morning, has sent a clear message already in 2017. Since then, we have seen a series of European and international conferences on institutional autonomy and academic freedom. The Vienna Declaration has been signed by lots of rectors warning against the tendencies um, to restrict academic freedom and the role of higher education. We have seen the I stand with EU, EU, CEU actions. And later on, the CEU case prompted the European Parliament to adopt a recommendation in defense of academic freedom with reference to Article 13 in the Charter of Fundamental Rights in the EU. That recommendation is aimed to be part of the Copenhagen criteria for future accession to the EU. Major EU programs are being opened up, including countries where indeed the concerns regarding institutional academy, uh, autonomy and academic freedom are more widespread even than in Europe, such as, for instance, Turkey, China, Russia. The EU seems to be dedicated to reach out to the world and to uphold these European values. Yet, as Michael Ignatiev, president of the CEU, said also in Europe, academic freedom or even the university cannot be taken for granted. The question can be asked whether universities have ended up on the wrong side of history, as Peter Scott put it, and whether this is the university's own mistake. Well, there seems to be some blame on the drive of universities to want to become world class, to position themselves on ranking and then to be seen, to create a divide with local, regional and national responsibilities, as Alan Hazelcorn said it. In that frame, internationalization is a cosmopolitan project. Clearly, the rise of populism has been a wake up call and we, Many universities may have been rather followers than leaders. But the rise of populism is not only a wake-up call and various constructive responses are emerging. There's more projects on diversity, equity, inclusion, on inclusive internationalization in a shift from global back to the local. But despite these recent initiatives, big questions keep blowing our minds. Why, for instance, despite all the European study courses and mobility programs, young Europeans seem to have taken democracy, open borders, freedom, liberal values, and the institutions to protect them so much for granted? Given the differentiation between the generations on the Eurobarometer, with the young generation more in favor of the EU, 
Let's hope that more young people will participate in the upcoming elections for the European Parliament than they did in the previous ones, only 18% in 2014, or on the Brexit referendum. In any case, as educators, we owe it to these young Europeans to be optimistic. It's a moral duty, moral duty, as we learned from Karl Potter, Popper, the great defender of an open society. So we're all on a learning curve. And what we can learn from the past? I like to quote Karl Stalker, the president and rector of Leiden University. If anything, it is that out of conflict comes collaboration. Brexit will not hold science because the challenges of the world are bigger than the fights between nations. And it's in everybody's best interest to work together. Thank you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mahek, for that fascinating tour of the, the changing uh, global space uh, in science and higher education and links to the political and, and, and economic currents of, of today. We have about five minutes left, um, and I'm going to uh, resist the temptation to ask a question myself because I think we only have time for three. So we'll take a block of three questions. We have one two and um, we can take one one more question would anyone like else like we'll, we'll, <coughs> we'll take a block of of three uh, and then we'll we'll hand back and perhaps we can have an answer to all of them this is the last chance i feel like an auctioneer at this point <laughs> for a third question okay maybe i'll slip mine in after all then. thank you Teresa, and thank you Marit, for your terrific presentation about europe as a whole and uh, i have one question and one little remark uh, the question is Jacob Shapiro, a few weeks ago, who is a kind of American expert in geopolitics, uh, made a speech in the uh, uh, um, National Italian Annual Geopolitical Conference. And basically the point was, it was all about, you know, uh, uh, this, this kind of relationship between Italy and China, etc. The, 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 the point was, okay, do you stand with us or with China? So my, my question is, how can we strengthen our relationship with China, avoiding the US, which is the strongest country in science and everything, uh, avoiding the US becoming too nervous. The little remark is that in one of the slides you have, you didn't put Croatia as member of the European Union. Uh, Lily Yang, doctoral student from the University of Oxford. Thank you very much for your wonderful speech and it opens up the, our discussions of EU-China partnership that goes beyond the national border or the EU border. And I wonder, reflecting to what, I, we, what we have been discussed in the morning, that we realize the problems of the well, overwhelming market logic here and we have emphasized the academic community and the people, or what we call common good when we discuss Brexit and EU. But, but to me, when we come to talk about China, there is a shift of tone towards more geopolitical discussions. And besides, of course, besides the market discussions, <laughs> economic discussions, less discussion or less interest in the common good. And as an international student, originally from China, I try to kind of look from both perspectives and the more I try, the clearer I can feel the existence of the lack of mutual understanding and misunderstanding. So, and this is also uh, relative to, uh, re relevant to what you mentioned, internal concerns and external concerns. So I wonder what's your comments on this shift of tones and what universities can do in terms of this misunderstanding and the lack of understanding, thanks. So, well, I'll just finish off then with a, was there, was there another question? No. I'll just finish off then with, a, I, I'd, I'd like to ask you about if you have any reflection um, pushing you a little bit beyond the, the, your original remit on China's relationship with the Global South. 
certainly for, the, for those uh, um, of, of people in this room who research African higher education, for example, it's, a, it's an ever-present issue, the, the strong role that China has uh, generally in development um, and particularly in higher education, both in, in funding programs within Africa, but also in, in attracting a lot of African students to, to China. Um, and uh, critiqued by some as a very old school kind of infrastructure based investment and reinforcing dependency, but certainly very welcomed by many African states. So, opinions very divided. If you had any reflection on. on <clears throat> How to avoid the US? <laughs> Well, I think the whole discussion uh, relates to, to Lily's point. The whole discussion about Chinese rise and the role of China in higher education or in the world is, is very strongly colored by U.S. discourse. And that precedes the current administration. That precedes the current administration. Um, already under President Obama, of course, there was a strong uh, the pivot on Asia, but that was a positive one. Let's engage more with Asia. Um, the Trump administration has a um, far more protectionist uh, view. But you, you also hear me say that you know, the, the EU has also been assertive enough to say, okay, if we do trade, you do it on unequal terms. And I'm saying that the EU should do that on its own, uh, re for its own reasons um, and on its own um, competencies. And actually, I think that the EU may well have, and that, that's why I emphasize the trade and, and the anti antitrust uh, powers of the EU, they may actually be stronger in some areas than the EU, uh, than the US. You can see that, for instance, in how the EU uh, deals with the big tech companies. The US doesn't even have the, the, the legal powers to, to, to do something about Google and Facebook, etc. The EU is, well, I think the, a very important player. Um, it's crafting its, it has crafted its own history, it will craft its own future. Um, but certainly the discourse, and that's, that's I think what Lily is also referring to, the discourse on China is incredibly U.S. Um, colored, influenced, and I, I hear a lot of people also in my own country basically following that. It, it becomes a sort of an echo mechanism. And what would be my advice? Well, first of all, we should all read your PhD thesis because you're, you're doing a crucially important piece of, piece of work in this respect. Um, collaborate, you know, that's, that's the way to, to, that has always been, that's why I like the, the final quote so much. It's always been, should realize that even when countries have cut diplomatic relationships, collaboration in science, culture, sports continues, and that's important, that's important. Um, so I think we should, we should be aware of that. We should find our own um, partnerships and not turn away from the U.S. I mean, that would be <laughs> the stupidest thing to do. So that's why I think, well, I'm not here to, to promote the EU. I'm trying to be a scholar and to analyze things. But I think the fact that these programs are opening up to the world, that's to all sides, is a very good thing. As long as we can, you know, afford and afford it and find partners that wants to positively respond to that, that's the, fant the best role we can play in the world, I think. Uh, to the global south, I was saying in the beginning, I'm not, you know, <laughs> not, I don't, I don't know so much about it, but I, th <laughs> I think what China is doing in, in Africa is immensely important, also for for universities. Um, what I know from from African rectors is that. They <laughs> say it's it's nice. They don't only build your lab; they also build the road to it. And you know what? They're not going to bother you with conditions on uh, who has to work there and uh, when and how many hours. Um, there is also a discussion down in Europe, uh, and I was invited to it last week, which um, to a seminar under the title "China as New Imperialist Power?" Question mark. I said at my opening there. It's good to ask that a Dutch person. We know everything about being an imperial power. <laughs> On that note, um, thank you very much. We are uh, immediately after this, we're going to move to uh, straight to the parallel sessions. There'll be two sessions now before tea. But before we do that, please could you join me in giving a, a very warm thank you for that fantastic tea.
Okay, thanks everyone. Um, we're ready to start the parallel session. In this case, we're going to be looking at common goods. Um, it's an increasingly important area for CG and it's expanding out of 10 different countries that are researching this area. But today we're going to be hearing from two countries uh, that were core and original countries involved in the research. Japan, but to begin with, Lin Tian will be talking about China. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lin Tian. I come from Shanghai Jiao Tong University as a research assistant in CG. Um, I'm doing um, project 1.2 with my supervisor, Professor Liu. And I'm very happy today to have this opportunity to share our research with all of you. The research topic for project 1.2 is inward international students in China and their contributions to global common goods. As you can see, the two keywords in our research are the um, inward international students and the global common goods. Um, we have given a quite clear definitions about bo both words in our working paper, so I'm not going to talk too much about the definitions here. But one thing I um, need to point out is that the um, idea of common goods. Um, for common goods, they require collective participation, which means these goods are often socially embedded and they may confine to a certain group or community. So we can have local, global, and uh, local, national, and global common goods. As you can see, the global um, common goods, they are related to all people worldwide with global relevance, which are beneficial to people worldwide. Um, and then I'll give you an overview of our research. Uh, I have um, explained the key concepts in our research and then it's about the purpose. Um, the research purpose is to identify the national and global common goods produced in inward student mobility and also to examine the impact of policies on inward student mobility. In terms of the research method, we used both semi-structured interviews and document analysis with semi-structured interviews, interviews as the main research method. We have interviewed 27 Chinese participants. They come from both the government and higher education institutions. So they are policy makers, uh, university leaders, administrators, as well as the international students with different cultural background. In our research, we also do something about comparative analysis between um, universities at different levels and also um, between uh, different disciplines, uh, especially the engineering and economics. Um, you can find more information in our working paper about the comparative analysis. Then I, I would like to give you some background information about the history, development, and the changes of the international education in China. As you can see, the international education in China started from the year 1950, um, and it has undergone five major periods in the past seven decades. So in the first period, we call it as the initial practice of international education. In this period, China conducted more international exchanges with socialist countries in the former Soviet Union and developing countries in Asia and Africa. China accepted about 7,000 international students in this period. And in the second period, there was a short break off in the whole higher education system in China due to the bad domestic economic environment and the uneasy political situation in China. Um, and later in the year 1973, China, China's um, higher education institutions resumed its um, recruitment of international students. So from the year 1973 to 1977, China only accepted about 2,000 international students. So you can say, a big decrease when compared with the previous period. Then in the third period, reform and opening up in the year 1978 brought new um, directions for the international education in China. In this period, China uh, witnessed uh, a low speed progress. 120 higher education institutions accepted about um, 14,000 students. Uh, from 124 countries. 
And then is a then then is the fourth period. China established a new system with self-operating um, and under the guidelines of the government. So China entered the first period of rapid development. Uh, more than 300 higher education institutions accepted about 230 international students from more than 116 countries. And um, the, in the fifth period, it's from the year 1999 until now, um, you see, uh, we see a rapid development in the international education in China with well-designed policies. From the year 1999 until 2016, China accepted about 4 million international students from more than 200 countries. Apart from this, in different periods, um, China has um, different uh, relevant uh, policy documents, and you can also find more information in our working paper. And then I'll, um, I'll show you some numbers. The uh, figure one um, shows the increased number of international students in China. You can say in the year 2000, this number was only 50,000, but um, 16 years later, um, this number um, is nine times of the um, year 2000. Uh, so you see a huge development uh, in the number of in international students in China, and the latest number for last year, 2000 and, uh, 2018, the number was half million. And then in terms of the source countries of international students, uh, you see most uh, um, international students in China come from Asia, and the students come from, from South Korea actually made, uh, make up the top one group in China's international students. Uh, apart from this, you can also say uh, stable uh, but quite slow development of the international students number from both the Europe and Africa. Uh, as you can see, um, in the past seven decades, China experienced a, a huge development um, of its international education, gradually shifting its role from a traditionally dominant co source country of international students um, to a popular um, study abroad destination of international students. Uh, based on this, our research uh, wants to know what are the global common goods of inward student mobility in China and how the key policies, strategies, and uh, regulations concerning inward international students relate to global common goods in China. I will then present some key findings of our research to all of you uh, based, based on our semi-structured interviews and the document analysis. The first is about the contributions of inward uh, student mobility in China to global common goods. Um, based on our research findings, both the policymakers and higher education institutions valued the common goods created by inward student mobility, and there are five perceived global common goods. That is global talents, shared educational resources, increased cultural diversity, improved practices and policies, as well as the potential economic growth point. However, the, the last one, the economic aspects, is now not a main focus for the international higher education in China. Um, most participants in our research, they emphasized the in-house soft power brought by the uh, international students, and this could be regarded as a national common good with national boundary. Um, so um, boosting the inward student mobility is not only an opportunity for the Chinese culture and language, but also a good opportunity for soft power expansion. Um, however, our, most of our um, participants suggest, strongly suggest that we should never treat the international students as cash cows, and we cannot only see their um, economic benefits and to see the international education as a pure business transaction. So in China, the um, international education is more like a process of reciprocity. It is closely to, related to the idea of global common good, which means each par both parties, both the higher education institutions and the international students, they need each other to achieve their intended goals. 
and uh, um, so the international uh, ed the international students want wants to have uh, life exchanging periods through experience through the international education. So this is also a process of self uh, forming. But the higher education institutions they want to. Uh, boost their inf um, international influence or reputation or something. So this process actually emphasizes the co um, connective endeavor, um, shared participation and engagement, and also the inclusion and the responsibility. Okay, then it's about the um, policies and the practices of international students studying in China. From our research, we say uh, quite supportive policies and strategies from both the government and the universities. For both uh, the case study universities in our research, they have um, specific strategies for uh, inward student mobility and the internationalization. And in terms of the government policies, mm, in inward student mobility has been given a special priority in China. Um, because the Chinese government continuously adjusted um, relevant policies towards the international education. For example, in the plan of study in China, it aims to um, accept half a million international students by the year of 2020. And we, within these students, 150 of them 150,000 of them studying at the tertiary level with a degree education. Um, we have already achieved this, uh, this goal. And then last year, China issued the quality standards of higher education for international students studying in China. It clarifies the um, quality standards for international education in China. However, um, there are still some tensions among policies, practices, and global common goods uh, in the inward student mobility process. For example, the employment issues. Um, although both the Chinese government and the higher education institutions attempt to attract more international students and then to build a global talent pool, um, however, there is um, not a com com very comprehensive employment mechanism for the international students, so they feel um, very difficult to stay a, at China. Um, this makes China fail to um, retain these global talents who want to stay and work at China and also make contributions to China. But very recently, a few of um, coastal metropolitan cities, they adjusted their policies um, especially for the postgraduate students, for the postgraduate international students to work at China, they give up more flexible policies and uh, requirements for them. And we do hope that this policy, um, these policies will um, extend, expand in the whole country within the coming years. So these are the um, key points of our research findings. And if you are interested about it, you can uh, find more information in our working paper. Um, thank you very much. Okay, now we can take questions. I don't know where the uh, microphone is. Ah, great. So, I will just work. If you can identify yourself uh, when you make your, before you are asked your question. Uh, uh, thank you for for your introduction of your uh, research. I come from uh, China, but now I'm a, a visiting scholar in UCL. I come from Central China Normal University in Wuhan. Um, my question is: that the background I I want to say just now from the morning. Till now, the people talk about, I call it, and the situation is new European centralism, new European or Europe centralism. Why I talk about this? 
because when they talk about blizzard, blizzard, they, most of people feel despair or they, they feel pity to blizzard. But I think uh, it's, it's a good thing to the world because we talk about globalization, not Europeanization. So I want to ask you one question. And in this situation, you mean common good. What do you common good mean to European countries, especially to UK? You mean common good. And what does it mean to European countries or UK? I, because I think some of European country professors or scholars, they only care about this. They don't care about globalization. And uh, yes, this idea of common good is actually is first proposed by the UNESCO in the year 2015. Um, so it's only four, three or four years ago. This is a trend. This is a new idea because um, in the past we emphasize public good. The public good is more related to the political um, political sense. So um, I know your um, idea about the European or the UK. Maybe they emphasize the public public thing most rather than concerning others. But the common good, yeah, we have, I just, just as I said before, the common good also have its um, national boundary, but the global common good is a more um, extensive and a more inclusive idea. And this is a trend, so this is a new trend. You can see we are talking more and more about this idea. Um, and I think there are also um, more and more um, European scholars, they focus on this idea. Um, and this could be a new direction for the um, international education, for also for the higher education um, system. And yeah, so th that's also one purpose of our, um, of our working paper to propose this idea to make emphasis on this idea so, so, as, so that we can build a really inclusive world which, um, which emphasizes the shared participation and uh, engagement, also the responsibility of each other rather than only one um, stakeholder or something. Thank you. And thanks for your uh, very interesting research. And I'm Jie Xiu from LOE. I'm a PhD candidate. Uh, I have two small questions. The first one is following your previous discussion about this kind of European, um, what does it mean to the European countries? Uh, uh, because you mentioned the reci reciprocity. It's a very Chinese concept and idea. I'm wondering what is the contribution of Chinese experiences to the global common good, I mean, according to your research? And the second question is about, um, um, because you interviewed the university leaders, academics, and also the international students, I'm wondering, um, their different positions and their cultural context and their personal backgrounds, how would that influence their understandings about the um, common good and the, their positionality? How does it affect your um, analysis and uh, research? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, for the first question about the um, China's contributions to the uh, global common good or to, to the whole higher education landscape. Um, uh, okay, so um, as we heard this morning about the uh, trend of marketization and commercialization, especially in the international education in some Anglo-Saxon countries, for example, Australia and the, um, the UK. So we, we don't think this trend is good, right? And uh, um, if we focus too much on this trend of marketization, that means we only focus on the economic benefits of the international education and then ignoring, ignoring the um, cultural and the social benefits of um, international students. Um, so that's why we propose this idea of, com uh, of internet, um, global common good, because in China, um, the Chinese go most of the um, higher education institutions are nationally government supported. Uh, we don't put much emphasis on the economic aspects um, on the international education. Um, in contrast, these international, edu uh, in these international students, they got a lot of scholarships from the government. So 
Um, I think in my working paper, I propose the idea of the ethics of care, which means the higher education institutions as one side need to um, care about the international students as the other side, and also the international students uh, should understand and should value the efforts the um, higher education institutions and the Chinese government, um, what, what work have they done for them. So um, I think this could be a, a good, a promising direction just as a that question. And the, for the question um, number two about the different backgrounds of our um, participants. And I think it is um, necessary for we, uh, for we have like uh, various um, backgrounds uh, backgrounds of the, our participants, because um, common good, the idea emphasizes the inclusion, and we need to have a quite inclusive understanding of this idea. So um, if we have the diversified background of our participants, we can get a more comprehensive understanding of this idea. Thank you. Wait, Lily, would I wait for a second? Yes, hello, my name is Barbara Kim. I'm from Germany. I am a higher education researcher at the uh, Leibniz Center for Science and Society of the University of Hanover. Um, my question would be whether, but, but I'm not sure whether you have these statistics in China at all, but whether you make a distinction in your study between uh, international students that come to China for only a temporary period of study abroad and international students coming for a whole degree program. It has turned out that this is very important uh, for Europe because uh, there is this distinction between Erasmus students who only come for some credits and uh, inter other international students coming for a whole program. I think, or I, I assume that many of the European and American students that chi come to China come to learn the Chinese language and they might just study temporarily at a Confucius Institute or at a department for, for Chinese language and that their motivations are totally different from the students that come for a whole degree program. Um, and they m also might have a different, um, uh, a different position on, uh, you know, what is uh, uh, common good and, and, um, and so on. So that's why I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, actually, in this research, we only interviewed nine um, international students with different cultural backgrounds. Some of them come from Europe and some of them come from Europe and some of them from East Asia. And all of them are the um, degree students, the students for degree education, because we um, interviewed students uh, from the bachelor study, master study, and the PhD study, so in different stages. So we only have like nine students. Um, yeah, so um, for their motivation, um, according to our uh, research data, because this is a small sample, um, most of them are quite um, I mean, uh, positive about this, um, these research questions. But if we are going to do a further research uh, regarding to um, your question, we will have like more um, specific, um, specific differentiation of their background so we can have a more accurate result. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I just have a quick comment. Um, I know that you have the interview with one top tier Chinese university and the other one is a lower tier Chinese university. And from what I know, and this is also a kind of a preliminary result from a research done by colleagues in China. So they interviewed um, administrative staff in Chinese universities. They found that although for elite universities, the main motivation is not economic motivations. But for some lower tier universities, they are asking also for economic motivation. But this is not just for more money. It's more about the freedom or autonomy of how to use that money in terms of because in China, the financial sources are quite rigid. You have specific schemes of the research, um, maybe other kind of fundings, and you can only use that in a certain way. But then for those tuition fee from international students, they may have the autonomy of using it in other 
um, areas of what, whatever they want. So maybe this also uh, related to the common good of facilitating or enhancing universities' autonomy in terms of financial autonomy. Uh, okay. uh, I'm not sure where, whether I got your... Um, it's just a comment, don't worry. Okay. Okay. Um, Do you want to make a comment about the comment? Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and actually, about the tuition fee of the uh, international students, we, we do charge the tuition fee from the international students, but they got um, a, a huge amount of, not a huge, uh, a large amount of um, scholarship which can cover their tuition fee, and they can also use this money to, like for saving. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure about your question, uh, about your comment, um, whether it uh, will um, boost the autonomy. Actually, I'm not sure about it. I just made a comment about the um, tuition fee. Thank you. Okay. We're fine for time. We're, this will probably be the last question, but we can, we can fit this one in. Uh, actually, because we, uh, the sample is two universities. One is a top research university, top in the country. Another one is also a research university. It's also included uh, in the so-called double world-class project. In that sense, it's also elite university, but a much lower level. So for both of these elite universities, there's no, uh, no problem. But uh, I, I agree with you that uh, for Further lower level universities, they don't make money, like Australian universities, UK universities. But for these elite universities, they are not concerned very much with the money making. Thank you very much. Okay, great. I think we better call it a day there for the, this, the questions here, and we'll move move on now to the next paper. Butao and Kiyomi, who are going to be discussing something similar, but in the case of Japan. Uh, good afternoon again, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you about uh, our recent uh, findings of a, a project uh, which is concerned with the public goods of uh, higher education in Japan. This is a one more case study of uh, East Asian countries. This is about uh, case study of, of Japan. And Last year, I, I came here and uh, I gave a talk about uh, public goods of uh, uh, higher education in Japan, focusing on uh, inbound international students to Japan's uh, universities. And today, uh, I'd like to focus on the broad public goods of higher education of Japan at large. As you can find, my Subtitle is about uh, findings based on a literary, literary, literature review and interviews. So uh, I'd like to begin with a lit literary review. Because of the uh, limit of time, I'd like to, to uh, make a very brief uh, introduction to what we have found from uh, uh, literary review based on both English and earlier studies and also uh, pre uh, previous studies which have been uh, conducted in Japan in Japanese language. So we'd like to make a comparative study of uh, uh, similarities and difference in the understanding of the public goods of uh, higher education between uh, main Western countries, typically speaking is represented by the UK and the United States. And, uh, and Japan. So you can find that, uh, as a matter of fact, it's very difficult to find, find an, an exact equivalent to the English phrase public good in Japanese language. Uh, but we did find a similar word which seems to be widely used uh, in terms, in relation to the English term um, public good. In Japanese, you call it kokyuzai, and I think many of our Chinese colleagues could understand the meaning of uh, the Chinese characteristics. Means uh, everything is for, 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 for the public, and, but you can't find the meaning of uh, 
goods from this uh, Japanese uh, phrase, which means that little research or little discussion has been uh, conducted in Japan about the understanding and the interpretation of the phrase public goods. And we made a very brief uh, uh, compare study of uh, uh, main points uh, of the public goods of higher education between the Western countries and the Japan. And you can find in many Western countries, especially in the UK, because our project is uh, and the funding comes from uh, the the UK. So we, we focus on a, a literary, literary review, uh, review in relation to earlier studies, uh, mainly by, I mean, the British scholars and the researchers. And uh, in Western countries, the, the phrase, the public goods of higher education, are not only considered as, uh, I mean, the benefits of goods of uh, how to say it, uh, economics, but also it is understood in, in a much more, I mean, I mean much broader pro, uh, perspectives. And uh, according to the earlier studies, I mean, conducted by, I mean, Western scholars, the phrase public goods could be understand, uh, understood or an interpreted from economic, sociology, political, and educational perspectives. And why in Japan, as I just mentioned earlier, very little discussion about, I mean, the public goods of higher education and has been uh, made. And in the last page of uh, PowerPoint, we, we have listed uh, an, an, some of the earlier studies which have been uh, conducted in Japanese language, you could only find very few, and most of them are more concerned with the understanding of the public goods from the economic uh, perspective. I think it is one of the most important difference, difference between um, the Western countries and uh, Japan in the understanding of the phrase public good. And here, and uh, I'd like to, to, to explain the reasons behind and why we could find a huge difference in the understanding and uh, interpretation, interpretation of uh, the phrase uh, public goods of higher education between Western countries and Japan. And uh, according to the earlier study, perhaps at least there are three main reasons that could be used to explain uh, <coughs> the difference between Western countries and Japan. The first is, um, since the end of the Second World War, the policy of economic growth has been oversized by the Japanese government uh, with the purpose of uh, rebuilding Japan. Uh, as a result, higher education has been mainly regarded as a tool of developing human resource, resource, resource especially for industry and the business. So there's no similar or equivalent phrase like uh, general public or public goods of higher education for uh, general public or for citizens in, in Japan. I think this is uh, uh, the first reason uh, that is uh, the, 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 the powerful influence from an industry and the business on the uh, production and the implementation of national policies of uh, higher education. The second reason is that, as you can find that in Japan, and there are there is a dual structure of public and private institutions, unlike, I mean, the China's higher education. One of the most striking characteristics of Japanese higher education is, is that the share of private pri uh, universities in Japan accounts for nearly 80% of total. Right? Well, in China, maybe I think the percentage of private uh, universities only 
and makes up for less than 30% of total. Uh, as you can find that in reality, since the quality of the, uh, private universities is very considerable, there's, uh, there are good leading private universities like uh, Waseda and Keo, which were established in the late 19th centuries, and there are much more small local private universities with uh, quite low quality. So because, I mean, the, the, the quality of a private university is very considerably, the general public has difficulty in pursuing public publics in overall higher education institutions. I think it might be the second reason. The third reason, which is, uh, I think it could be used to explain I mean, some of the similar semi, uh, phenomena in, uh, in China and South Korea, that is, there's an emphasis on entrance examination, then students learning. Like uh, China, and South Korea, Taiwan, maybe Hong Kong, Singapore. There's a strong belief that career opportunities largely depend on the specific university when it's recruited, admitted, and or when it's studied. Instead of what one learns there, Public interest directs to entrance examination over other social functions. If you are admitted in a leading university, or we call it a leader university, you don't have to worry about your career because the, the brand of your uh, belonging university could largely determine your uh, career, no matter how hard or even if, or no matter even if you, you do not study at all. So in Japan, there's a phrase that is, uh, university is a ledger land. And uh, I think this is uh, a brief introduction to the uh, uh, main points of the uh, literary review. You can find I mean, the difference between uh, Western countries and Japan in the understanding of public goods of higher education. So I come to the main part of my uh, talk. This is about main findings from interviews. And we did almost a similar interviews based on, and uh, that is uh, semi-structured interviews according to the project guideline. And uh, we conducted interviews with 10 key persons. And uh, next refers to the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology. And A, B, and these two persons are key persons who are responsible for making um, national policies of higher education. And also we, uh, we did interviews with uh, two uh, institutional leaders uh, who are in charge of uh, teaching and uh, education, uh, teaching and research. Uh, one of the universities is a leading university which was uh, founded in the late 19th centuries and is ranked among top five in Japan and also has a very high presence uh, according to the uh, global man uh, ranking system. And the other is a local comprehensive university. And also we did interviews with uh, several middle-level administrators. So we want to know how the phrase of uh, public goods of higher education are understood by uh, different stakeholders, including uh, government officials, institute leaders coming from two different universities, and uh, middle-level administrators uh, from two different universities. We have uh, selected uh, four main uh, questions, um, which seem to be relating to the uh, phrase, uh, the public goods of higher education. So, uh, the first question is, what do you understand by the term public good? As I mentioned earlier, in Japan, it's very difficult for us to find the precise equivalent to the English phrase public good. We only use the Japanese uh, translation, that is kokyuzai. That is, uh, it's a public, uh, something like uh, public uh, I mean, estate or something like that, which is, is, is largely different from the English meaning of a public good. And uh, before conducting interviews with all these key persons, we try to explain 
the original meaning of uh, uh, public good in other languages, especially in English language, the how the phrase is understood uh, in the English language and how the term is used in our project. And uh, we, we found more different views as you can find. Uh, compulsory education creates public goods, while higher education produces more private goods, both of the government officials and are working in the Ministry of Education. They are mainly responsible for making, it's a creating and implement, implement, uh, implement uh, carry out national policies of Japan's higher education. The key persons, they're very powerful in affecting uh, the making of uh, uh, higher education policies in Japan. I think the uh, points of view are very uh, representative. They said, higher education contributes less to public goods. And, and the second point, undergrad studies lead to more private goods because university graduates benefit more from them. In contrast, they admit, especially doctor education creates more public goods. So they clearly identify at least four dimensions of education. One is compulsory education, the other is uh, higher education. And then within, I mean, higher education or post-secondary education, they further classify teaching activities and research activities. So according to their, I mean, the responses, you can find. Okay, thank you. And they use four dimensions to use plan or show, to present their, their understandings of the phrase of public goods. I think they could largely represent points of view of the Japanese government. While uh, according to the uh, institute leaders, they emphasize that good should not be understood as a profit or benefit, but should be interpreted as a happiness or human being, a sort of a foundation on which sustainable development of human beings could be made and the betterment of a society. So you can find conflicting ideas or understanding of the phrase, but we did find common points between these interviews. They all admit that university research activities are directly concerned with public goods and social benefits, which are not only limited at the national level, but at the global level by almost all this is, I mean, think the, 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 the large po common points we could identify. Main finding four, the sec I mean, the finding of the second question is, what does higher education contribute to the public good or public goods? And you can find, although they talk in a, in a much, I mean, the broad sense, I think you can find similar, I mean, the statement in other countries like China. For example, I'm sorry for that. For, fostering uh, daily uh, talents for the next generation, producing knowledge for the welfare of the human beings and undertaking intellectual activities or pursuing. This is concerned with global public goods. And uh, most of them answered in a positive way. The third question is, can we measure that contribution? According to the two government officials, the answer is, difficult, but we should measure what kind of public goods have been achieved since we invest a lot on university education and, and uh, teach and, and research activities. Universities should be more accountable and transparent. While well, according to responses from these institute leaders and other uh, middle level uh, administrators that emphasize that Measurement or evaluation should be based on a long-term, I mean, the point of view. So you can find striking difference between the two groups. The last question is about, can higher education create public goods as well as public goods and both kinds of goods group together? All interviews claim that both kinds of goods could group together. And because of limited time, I apologize that at least I mean, the 
the answers to the first question and also the final question of the uh, project. And here are some of the main points of the uh, main findings based on our uh, interviews. And I will be very happy to take uh, any of the questions and comments. Thank okay. you. Right. Fine. Should I remain here? Yep, yeah, just stay oh, there. Okay. Has anyone got a question? Anyone like to forward anything? Oh, yep, here we go. Um, just a, uh, a quick question. Uh, among the stakeholders, did you include any members of the public? Uh, among, or, among the interviews? Uh, stakeholders, among the people whom you interviewed, did you involve anybody who is not in the university, who is in the, from the public, so, uh, so that you know what they feel about what the university should be doing? And the second suggestion is, you know, you said there was a problem in translating public good. Yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering whether, you know, having done some translation uh, in different languages, whether it would be uh, easy to spot by asking what is private good if there is an equivalent word, and that may give a clue to what's public good vis-a-vis -vis private good. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your questions. And uh, just shoot, I mean, the, the, I mean, the online interviews and amount of ten. So we have very rigid outline of uh, conducting interviews according to the project. And uh, I'm working on and the project point one point one point uh, point. 1.1 uh, 1. 1 is it about public goods of higher education. So we are asked to interview with uh, at least two government officials and two institute leaders from different universities. One should be a leading university, and the other is uh, and local comprehensive, but both of them should be uh, national or local public uh, universities. So among the 10 interview, uh, interviews, um, excluding A and B, uh, who come from the um, Ministry of Education, all of them are academics. And among the remaining eight interviews, and two of them are institution ins leaders, and two of them are, four of them are uh, middle-level administrators. So we, we try to, to, to find an uh, interviews with, uh, how to say, diverse background. And with the uh, uh, aim of uh, reflecting on different and uh, views or understanding of the public good of higher education in Japan, and uh, so as I just mentioned, that you could find a conflicting understanding of uh, the phrase "public goods of higher education in Japan" between the two uh, government officials and the other uh, remaining eight academics. This. I hope I have an answer to, to your first question. As for the second question, it's very difficult for us to, 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 to translate the English, the real meaning of uh, public goods in English language into local language, the Japanese language. And uh, as uh, explained, uh, before conduct, uh, conducting interviews, um, we, we made, and we tried ma making a, a more, I mean, the, the, the meaning of uh, the, the phrase of uh, public goods, of, uh, which are used in different areas, like uh, how it is used in economic uh, field, and how it is understood in education, including higher education, and how it is uh, employed in political science. So then we, we're trying to explain how it, it should be understood in the field of higher education. It, is, it, it was a very uh, difficult process. And as you mentioned, it could affect, I mean, the, I mean, the, the findings we have uh, I mean, achieved during the, the interviews with these uh, 10 interviews. And uh, because uh, 
um, according to their responses. And still, some of them still, it seems that some of them still did not understand the meaning of it, that the public goods, which could be used in, in higher education. They, they thought and public goods, uh, if it is used in Japan, it could be understood as a kind of uh, uh, economic benefit for a very limited group of people. For example, for, 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 for private in, uh, business or for, for industry, it is not catering for a general public. So we need to make a, 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 I mean the more comprehensive and in-depth and analysis of the findings from in interviews. It's uh, Mi Feng Li from the European Access Network. Um, it's just a comment, really. Could you go back to your first slide where you have the Japanese? Um, that's it. Perhaps, is there a way? You know, the last word, Chai, it's basically about money and wealth. And that it's, that in a sense, fix people's interpretation of the whole term. So maybe um, there is another word that you can replace because this literally it translates into commonwealth. So if there is a way to replace the last letter um, in Japanese, that may, it may be easier to convey the public good element of, of the phrase? And uh, we, we tried, and thank you for your comment. Can I, can I make, make feedback to the comment? And uh, in cases, without making any, I mean, interpreting an uh, explanation of the meaning of the public use in English, we ask our interviews, how do you understand the English meaning of a public goods? Because Almost all of them were, were graduated from university. They know the English phrase, public goods. And the mo most of them, almost all of them said, uh, in Japan, it could be translated like uh, kokyuzai or something like that. And uh, then we ask them, if we translate the Japanese term kokyuzai into English, what kind of words should be used? Most of them uh, were confused. I didn't know how to translate the, the Japanese phrase kokyuzai into, I mean, English language. But I uh, didn't know the meaning of uh, English language uh, public goods in, in Japanese language. I, I, I don't know. So we tried. And as that gentleman just mentioned, I mean, the understanding of the, the, the English word in Japanese language could largely affect, I mean, our findings of the interviews. Thank you for your talk. Um, would you be kind enough to go back to the interview slide, please? Thank you. Um, is there a reason why there's only one female interviewed? <laughs> um, being a female myself, and having taught a several Japanese students in my chronologically mature time, um, they have often complained of how difficult it is in Japan when they go back to rise to higher positions in several sectors, not just in education. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very good question and a very, and uh, several reasons for that. First, it's this, the same question. Okay, right. This talk is about the project 1.1. It's about the public use of higher education. And the second reason is we are asked to do, I mean, research. I mean, the into um, stakeholders only working in national universities. And the third is you can find two of them are government officials, two of them are institute, institute leaders, and, the other, and four of them are uh, middle level administrators. And uh, different, I mean, the, from an 
those who work in private universities. In national universities, there's less percentage of uh, female academics, and much less percentage of uh, either middle level administrators, there's a least percentage of uh, institutional leaders, uh, female institutional leaders. So we were asked to, to do case study. So the characteristics of a case study significantly determine the, the results. I mean, the, I mean the, a lot of results. The, how we should select the case study. And the, the, the percentage of female academics, especially and female administrators, at the uh, institute level, uh, uh, much less than those I working in the UK or in mainland China. Okay, we've got time. If you that ask that last question, and the others will start coming back any second oh, now. But oh, okay, me. thank you. Uh, I'm Xian Junyi, come from China, Central China, Normal University. Yeah, I also have comments about this interview. Yeah, I want to ask you what the uh, public good or public goods is political right or public right? Because those people are public person, a very important person. When you ask them the public goods, they will say like the sum. If you ask the persons or ask the people from countryside or ask the people, uh, their children graduate from the university but can't find a job, maybe they say don't have public good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just opposite. And I think it's, uh, I, mean the, I mean, the response from the two government officials could largely answer your questions you can find. Even they are key persons in charge of uh, producing and uh, implementing national policies of higher education. They do not necessarily admit that higher education has public goods in Japan. You can, you can find, they only emphasize that only compulsory education creates public goods, while higher education pro, pro, produce much more private goods. I think it's, that it could represent, I mean, the, the standpoint of Japanese government. And that standpoint has affected, I mean, the uh, high uh, national policies of higher education in Japan since the end of the Second World War. That's the reason why the percentage of private universities accounts for more than 80% of the total. Because I think undergraduate education does not have any public goods. Thank you. Right, I think that's it. I think there's a refreshment break now. But yeah, Thank you.